Godsworn is among the best indie real-time strategy games in development, which transports you back to the good old days of clearing neutral creeps, taking over map control to gather resources, getting new villagers to construct buildings, and using those buildings to recruit warbands full of colorful units with funky abilities to fight the other player with. Godsworn has been playable a few times already, during Steam Next Fests and playtests, letting many of us sink our teeth into some of the promised mythological RTS content. This includes heroes, units, spells and abilities of one of the main factions, the Baltic Pagans. Their heroes, the goddess Soul and moon god Menes, will be showcased in this demo gameplay on a 1v1 map, so we can go over the gameplay basics and why I like this game so much. My prowess is unmatched. You start with your hero, a shrine and two villagers who you need to construct buildings with to collect wood and food as your first basic resources. The flashing number icon to the left is for your divine skills panel, as you can choose your first ability slash power from the get-go. Abilities are the skills your heroes can use personally, while powers are skills you can use globally without the hero being present. This two-in-one approach might feel limiting at the start, but you can go back and unlock everything by the end of the match, so it isn't a matter of if, but when you unlock each skill. Villagers are your builders, workers and worshippers, meaning they both construct and man your resource gathering buildings while they can stay at the shrine, your HQ building and generate more fate for you. Fate being the additional resource necessary for using abilities, upgrades and recruiting mythical creatures. There are numerous creep camps around the map marked with white icons and those are an opportunity for you to gain experience points and worshippers. A few wolves or armed bandits await you there and so far in this version of the game they do not become much harder to fight but probably will in future versions of the game. I choose the wrong camp to attack with just my hero so I had to turn back and run to my shrine to build a war camp and recruit some backup for my hero. This costs just wood as do all the starting buildings but to be able to recruit units I also need to expand my population limit with some houses. Godsworn does have a unit limit and while that might disappoint some of you, that fact simply goes best with the core design of the game, which as I mentioned in the intro, is small warband supporting your hero. Clearing a camp frees up a worshipper and helps my economy by giving me a new worker to add to my gathering buildings or use for new constructions. The tribesman is my first unit, which I can recruit from my war camp and it will cost me a bunch of food to get the spear and shield infantry unit. Its best use is against mounted units of the Order Crusaders faction, but in a mirror match against another player using the Baltic Pagans, it will be the frontline unit for the first part of the match. The sleep spell has an interesting cost system, as it has both a very limited circle range and it gets cast a few seconds after being targeted, meaning you have to have some foresight as you use it. With more experience comes a new level and the opportunity to unlock a new ability slash power. There is a skill to turn humans into wolves or teleport units at the targeted circle back to your shrine HQ. Both have some utility depending on the situation. Food stocks are low. With more villagers and the need for food to recruit units, I have to expand food production with a hunter's lodge, which I will place at the wildlife resource point represented by the deer's icon. This is exactly why multiple foresters are necessary as wood for construction is as vital at the start of the match as is food for tier 1 unit recruitment. The economy of Godsworn might have more resources than you're used to in similar small scale games, but they become necessary in stages so you won't get overwhelmed with too many requirements just for tier 1 units. The Witch Cabin is the second unit recruitment building for the Baltic Pagans faction and it is there you can start recruiting your first magical and mythical units, like casters or beasts. In the war camp, the second unit are the skirmishers, which have short-range attacks and cost not just food, but also wood to produce. The witch is the first unit available for recruitment at the witch cabin, which is fitting considering its name, and has an upgrade for casting a stick and bones curse on enemy units. 
the which requires faith along with food, balancing out the need for wood at the war camp, but once again showing the high need for food production to keep recruiting units. Prince of with a few more units under my command, I can now attack the more central creep camps which have stronger units and free up additional worshippers for my base to work at resource gathering buildings or generate faith by worshipping at my shrine. For these tier 1 units, you only need to keep upgrading your base resource production and construct additional houses, while to prepare the upgrade to tier 2 units, you have to clear the creeps from the nearest mine location. On a 1v1 map, there are only 4 such locations, so these become the hotspots for conflict if you want to protect your wealth income or starve the enemy of theirs. Once you stockpile a bit of hate, you can spend it to upgrade the types of units you have been producing, which are the tribesmen, skirmishers and witches. The jewel order is the building which you construct at the mine for ore and where your villagers will produce wealth for you. When you finally meet the enemy hero in combat, you'll be happy to learn that you can put him to sleep using your divine skill and keep your own hero out of range as Menace is a ranged one while Soul is a melee one. Managing to take out an enemy hero in combat will give you a huge boost to experience points and let you unlock new divine skills. This kind of a mid-map skirmish is best done when you can attack your enemy right after or while they are clearing out a creep position. You might also manage to pick up a drop or two of belt from chalice-like items. Going back to base is when you can put that vain teleport skill to use and regroup for future skirmishes much faster. The movement speed of units across the map is slower than some competitive RTS games you might be used to, and for me personally that is a good thing. I always prefer real-time strategy games where you have time to think about what you want to do and win due to a better idea than the ones where speed of moving and clicking is what leads to victory more often. The Marauder is the last available unit for recruitment at the war camp and its high damage output comes at a high cost, as you have to spend wealth in addition to food to recruit this unit. The Werewolf at the Witch Cabin is similarly powerful but cheaper and requires faith instead of wealth, so you can get a stronger frontline unit no matter which resource you have available more of. Early base raids are not very effective against buildings themselves as those early units can't deal enough damage to them, so while the AI had the right idea, it didn't execute this attack properly as he should be targeting my worshippers. This is the point where I hoped that I could use the ritual of the wolf skill on my enemy units, but figured out it only works on my own humans. And for just 25 fate, it would be very overpowered if I could take away an enemy unit and turn it into my own anyway. So I just go with recruiting my own werewolf. The upgrades for the units I have already recruited get very pricey as you unlock more and more of them, but I'm happy to pay all the fate necessary to get more out of the units I have already recruited. So while the warbands in Godsworn don't end up with a huge number of units, the upgrades increase both their utility and power, making fewer units much stronger and capable of not just hero killing but also base busting. I do know that for this ultimate goal I need the strongest units available and so I go on increasing my economy and boosting my income of resources across my side of the map. This is where new worshippers being spawned at my shrine HQ come to be very useful as the second source of new villagers for my tasks. Upgrading the same shrine is also the path to unlocking the most powerful units in the buildings in which I can recruit them. That upgrade also increases the shrine's HP by more than double, making it much more difficult for my enemy to destroy. Naturally, it is a pricey upgrade, so I need to keep clearing creeps, making new resource gathering buildings and increasing my economy. At level 4, I get to choose between a hero and a global skill, but interestingly enough, the global skill directly and forever boosts my hero's damage output with more plates he can throw at distance. So I go with that. At about 10 minutes in, you would expect the match to be going head to head at this point, but as I said, this game isn't that fast and I'm still clearing the map of creeps and expanding my economy by rescuing more worshippers. 
I know all will not like this kind of slower expansion gameplay and fewer pressures to attack the enemy early on. And that is ok. We all find RTS games we like more or less. So feel free to tell me in the comments which games Godsworn reminds you the most of and did you enjoy playing them. One unit that I loved in this demo was Pukis, the mythical creature that breathes fire on enemies and eats them after battle to digest them and turn them into wealth. I honestly do not remember ever seeing such a unit mechanic in RTS games before, but if anyone does, do remind me of it. Obviously, playing against the AI isn't a huge challenge here, but I usually use the AI to be able to show you a match blow by blow and talk about different elements that come up as the match goes on. It also depends on the type of video I want to make, as for example, my previous video about global configuration was based only on multiplayer gameplay which is much faster, as is the game itself, and a more edited type of a video was called for. My first pukis is now ready and I include it in my first combat group made up of melee units, despite its range fire attack as it will be best used against multiple enemies at the front line. Unfortunately, it was caught in a skirmish and died too soon, but I made sure the enemy hero paid the price for it. Because of my choice of the warrior patron skill, I now have a considerable amount of fate as each fight and defeated enemy gets me even more of it and I can spend it on new units or divine skills to help me take out even more enemy units. It could be a sign of a snowball effect, but I can't say it is detrimental to gameplay since I haven't played enough matches to be sure of it. One thing that does annoy me is how the pickup of chalice items works and takes far too many moves and clicks to get them. This sort of stuff is obviously expected from games in development and I am not saying this has to be perfect now, just what needs to be fixed in the future. After a while, the AI does get into the habit of attacking my resource gathering outposts but with too few units to make an impact. He does however give me the idea what I should be doing. Considering the fact that resources are all over the map, I am basically playing this as a low actions per minute newbie and should be instead sending small parties of 2 to 3 fast units across my enemy's part of the map, sniping his villagers or burning down his gathering buildings. What should we do? This is undoubtedly how player versus player matches between top players are going to go down and they will feel much faster for it. The next minutes of the match go on in a similar pattern, with me expanding my resource collection operations across my part of the map, adding new houses to increase my unit limit, as well as farmstead buildings for growing food, recruiting more units, unlocking upgrades for them and defending against every new attack by the enemy AI. After my third unit recruitment building, the warrior's hall is finished, I proceed to learn about the capabilities and upgrades for the raider mounted unit and the wolf warrior. These are much more expensive units to recruit and their upgrades have some great synergies with other units. The wolf warrior in particular and their pack tactics upgrades allows them to get a boost to their stats when there are several of them or other wolf units in your war party. Alka is the fourth recruitment building in the Baltic Tribes faction and the one where you finally get units which can deal quite a bit more damage, especially to buildings. Adding a watchtower to defend my base from a frontal attack is a move that works against the AI very often and requires just wood to be built. But against human opponents, such watchtowers as defensive buildings are going to be much more necessary next to your resource collection buildings across the map. I simply wanted to have more time to come back and defend my base from future attacks the AI would undoubtedly keep sending my way. At the Alka building I could recruit the Leshy, which can take a lot of beating and it is a frontline tank while also dealing the damage type Siege, meaning it can destroy buildings the fastest. Sprigana on the other hand is a caster unit that deals area of effect damage to multiple enemies and can even slow them down with the first upgrade. While the Lashi gets both health regeneration and toxic damage to enemies that attack it. The Pukis and its ability to regurgitate wealth it eats from dead enemies requires some time and manual management to use, but it's just so crazy you can't possibly mind it. Watching it snack up on enemy corpses, 
find gold in their pockets and grow from it, only to shrink once more as it regurgitates that wealth in neatly packaged chalices for you on command is both hilarious and unique. Future upgrades for some of the units don't cost fate but instead wealth, so this ability of the pukis is actually very welcome to help you make your units stronger and more versatile like wolf warrior getting lifesteal. With these new units in action and all the divine skills I have unlocked at this point, it gets really easy cutting down enemy units and I can start attacking the enemy base as well. Blood Moon, available at level 7, is a really powerful skill as old units not only gain strength and power, making them stronger, but also restore their health for every enemy killed or turned into shadows if they die themselves. Taking over enemy resource points on their side of the map is the final step in preparations to attacking their base proper and attempt to destroy their shrine HQ. At this point I was having a lot of unemployed worshippers at my own shrine, resulting in quite a considerable overhead of fate. Starving the enemy of resources also meant he started attacking my base with fewer and fewer units, almost the lone hero. At last, you can watch the Lashy in action as he defends my own base supported by few other units and the watchtower. Walls are also a thing in Godsworn, but they cost a considerable amount of wood and I definitely wasn't on top of that as I was severely lacking it by the mid game. Adding one more forester wasn't going to provide the required amounts as fast as I needed it. My first attack on the enemy base wasn't well planned out as it happened more as a continuation of my harassment of his resource collection. But I wanted to see how the Blood Moon divine skill would do in a battle as I went all in. The effect above my unit's head makes it clear the skill is in effect as well as the dark red overtone all over the screen. I didn't want to risk my hero and continued attacking until I took out a few buildings and lost a few units to enemy watchtowers and shrine. After that I decided to regroup at my own shrine using the Vein teleport divine ability and also to show it off to you a bit more. Beyond the upgrade to level 2, my own shrine had a few upgrades for worshippers like boosting their HP and fate generation. Not that I really needed more of it. My next attack on the enemy base was going to be much more destructive and not only did I have more units but also new hero powers which I had unlocked. You can get extra fate by demolishing enemy buildings as well as killing enemies when using the passive upgrades and skills. I got a chance to use some of my new powers on the enemy hero and learned that by slaying them you actually get the highest fate boost at 50 points. This is the moment at which I wanted to disengage as I still had one more unit recruitment building to construct and try out its unit. That is the Celestial Hold and along with the recruitment of the most powerful unit, Lunar Star Daughters, it also contains the best upgrades for this faction. This unit actually takes up 4 population slots, while some of the other units we already took a look at take up only 1 or 2. All the upgrades here are quite expensive, so this is the start of the end game right here. And along with the unit endgame, I also used my resources to get the economy up to the endgame point with upgrades each of the resource gathering buildings offers. Some require wealth, others fate to buy the upgrades, but you definitely want to go through all the types and check what upgrades they offer, because the ones that just increase yield are simple enough, but if they offer more slots for villagers in each building of the same type, you have to consider if you have enough worshippers to fill these new slots. I certainly have a lot of resources stockpiled as I haven't lost many units against the AI, but in a match versus other players, you can be sure that without an endgame economy going, you won't be able to build up an endgame war party to go along with your hero and fight it out against the enemy to the bloody end. And since we are talking about a bloody end, here I do exactly that during my final push by using the Blood Moon Divine skill and all the other ones I have available to me. I got there just before the AI himself went for the endgame unit. I hope more of you will join the next playtest or demo of Godsworn and share through the word of mouth your impressions and experience with the game. These developers definitely need our support to have a good launch into early access and I want to see many of you in the multiplayer so I can play with you there. 
for more similar new RTS games, check out the cards on the screen. Thank you for watching and happy gaming!